Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lori, and thanks, Colleen, for the wonderful introduction and for arranging this webinar and handling all of the details. We really appreciate it. So welcome to our presentation. Uh, on our course, IADL 1110, you're going to hear that a ton today, um, an introduction to information studies. Um, our initial idea in offering this webinar for ACRL New Mexico was to share the details of a course that other academic librarians in New Mexico might want to offer at their institutions. However, we welcome those of you who are from other places in New Mexico and hope that you'll find something of use for your context. So we're gonna jump right in and start with a, a land acknowledgement. Oh. I'm going to do that, just a second. Here we go. Uh, founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to Indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. And those of you who know me, uh, know that I can't just leave it at that um, because I'm somebody who feels very <laughs> conflicted about land acknowledgements. Uh, optimistically, I want to see them as a beginning and a chance for learning, but they often feel like an ending when I hear them from non-Native people, um, as in, well, I've checked that box, I can move on. Um, in the interest of time, I will simply encourage you to follow the link included here at the bottom of this slide. Um, after the presentation, our slides will be available. And it's a, a text of an extended land acknowledgement that was written by Native UNM faculty and approved by the UNM Native Faculty Council. This also, this land acknowledgement here was as well. Um, it includes a brief history of Native peoples in New Mexico, as well as other valuable information about Indigenous rights. All right. Hi again. So we're, I don't know if we need to introduce ourselves, actually, but we are going to start with a little warm up after this. So since you already got our introductions and we waved, I'm going to move on to the next slide and we'll go around and answer the question. So this is our chance, hopefully, to learn a little bit about who's here at this webinar. So if you're willing, you can introduce yourself in the chat. Who are you? Where are you? Um, we're uh, We've, you've got our names for the presenters. We're all in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, but if you could teleport anywhere right now, where would you go? And also for, for folks who know me, you know that that's probably Cat My National Park and Preserve in Alaska, if I could go anywhere. Um, so Adrian, Alyssa. <laughs> sure, I'll go. So uh, I'm Adrian, I'm in my living room, puppy sitting. <laughs> And if I could teleport anywhere right now, I teleport to uh, somewhere where I could be snorkeling underwater. Nice. All right, and then this is Alyssa again. Um, I am in a study in Albuquerque and I would teleport to Hanalei Bay in Kauai. <laughs> Um, and I am Glenn. I am in our spare room. Um, and if I could teleport anywhere, I've been watching a lot of um, a re reality TV show called Below Deck, which is all about super yachts and sailing. Um, and they all have like wonderful chefs. So I think I would teleport to a super yacht. <laughs> <laughs> That's fancy. <laughs> all right. So I see some folks from different places. Hi, folks. Hi, Liz. Heidi, Jolene, Colleen. Um, love to see that we've got folks from out of state here. That's wonderful. Um, love to share with folks from other states. To a beach. <laughs> London, Colorado. Yes. I just want to go see the bears. That's that's all I want. OK, so let's go ahead. Thank you so much for participating. And what are we gonna do today? So first of all, I'm gonna start with this overview of information literacy at UNM and uh, this long GENMHED with general education, New Mexico higher education department, um, essential skills, 
Um, Alyssa will continue with an introduction uh, to the class, OILS 101 IADL 1110. Uh, Glenn's going to get into our, we call them many research projects, but sort of the focus of the course for the research projects, which is uh, involves Wikipedia. And Adrian's going to take us through a week in the life of the class. Uh, before uh, we get to the Q&A, we are going to share all of the complete course content, including all of the assignments, activities, assessments, um, everything that we could possibly uh, put together. Glenn put that all together. So thank you so much, Glenn, for doing that. Uh, Okay, and if you have questions, like uh, Colleen said, put them in the chat, uh, and hopefully we will get to them. Uh, well, let's get let's get started with a poll. So, I'm going to start this poll here. What kind of information literacy instruction have you provided? Okay, it looks like we have most people having voted at this point. Oh, a couple more coming in. All right. Here we go. So it looks like we have over half of folks who've been doing some credit course teaching, which makes me happy. And I suppose that's probably why you're interested in seeing what other folks are doing. And if I look like I'm looking off, not at the camera, it's because my Zoom stuff is all over on this other screen. Um, ooh, I love the embedded librarian, 50%. And I'm super curious about the other. Is anybody who clicked other willing to share what the other is? Either in chat or just by unmuting? All right, I will stay curious about that, maybe during the Q&A. Okay, so what does information literacy look like at um, UNM? So this is a picture of uh, our main campus library and it is uh, Zimmerman Library, historic building on campus. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with a Barbara Pfister quote. Uh, what happens in classrooms under the banner of information literacy has to include an understanding of information systems, the architectures, infrastructures, and fundamental belief systems that shape our information environment, including the fact that these systems are social, influenced by the biases and assumptions of the humans who create and use them. Um, if you aren't familiar with Barbara Pfister, she's an academic librarian and public intellectual who lately has been working with project information literacy on their algorithms project. And the piece that this quote comes from, she's talking about gaps in the way information literacy in our current context of rampant misinformation spreading through online networks. Um, I like her focus on systems. I have always felt that that's what distinguishes information literacy from other common goals of our undergraduate curriculum, like writing and critical thinking. And you'll, you can see this reflected in my own definition of information literacy from a paper that I wrote with some colleagues. Uh, information literacy, we see it as competence in working with systems of information to discover, evaluate, manage, and use information effectively in context, informed by an understanding of the social, political, cultural, and economic dimensions that affect the creation and dissemination of information within those systems. In this definition, we talk about using and developing skills with and understandings around information, but it's all in the context of those information systems that organize and deliver the information to us. And again, I think it's particularly important that we understand that social, cultural, political context uh, of those systems. So at UNM, our learning services group, and that's the four of us, uh, conceptualizes information literacy in a broad fashion. And we're trying to move away from a narrower focus only on academic 
and scholarly systems of information and teaching students how to use the library. So towards a broader outlook, which centers transferable skills and understandings that help our students make sense of and use information as professionals and citizens. So what does this look like? So we coordinate early undergraduate instruction, um, information literacy instruction, uh, which largely concerns English comp, which is English 1120 public speaking, which is COM 1130, and other first year transitional courses, first and second year transitional courses. In the past, we had a one-shot model, and I don't like that term, um, but it's so easy to slip into using it. I also call them course integrated workshops. Um, we typically provide a ton of course integrated workshops for first and second year courses. Well, we typically used to provide a ton for those first and second year courses. However, we relatively recently replaced that model with the research clinics model. So research clinics start with students completing um, a substantial online tutorial that usually probably takes them 45 minutes to an hour before they attend the clinic. It covers some conceptual understandings. The English 1120 looks at uh, information formats. The COM 1130 looks at authority. Um, additionally, it does some more basic things like covering uh, searching and relevant library databases and citation. So during the clinic, students bring whatever research project they are working on for their class with them and spend time at the clinic working on that assignment with obviously the help of librarians available. We also do snacks. Uh, the clinics are an hour and 15 minutes long and we make a point of talking to every single student and offering a little bit of individualized help. And that's really our goal to make students to make sure that students are getting effective individualized help at the point of need. So we really like these clinics because we get to hear directly from students and we see a wide variety of assignments. The, they've given us a better understanding of how our students are making sense of their information environment. And they've also helped us understand how information literacy is being integrated into the larger curricula. Uh, so Glenn and I wrote an article about this approach if you're interested in details, and we will have a list of references at the end. So in addition to research clinics, um, we do workshops, uh, a variety of kinds of workshops. So uh, UNM librarians outside of learning services and learning services librarians offer course integrated workshops, um, also workshops designed for specific programs like the McNair Scholars, as well as some standalone workshops on topics like designing effective presentations and citation management. And you all know I had to get a picture of a bear in there, but that's from an activity that I actually did in uh, a course integrated instruction session. Um, so the course that we will presently be discussing in depth today um, is now IADL 1110, which IADL stands for Information and Digital Literacy, but it was originally developed as OILS 101, and OILS 101 was developed to add some depth to the curriculum, um, sort of beyond that helping students with specific research assignments in the context of a course with consultations and instruction. Wales 101 um, was developed uh, by the instruction working group uh, before learning services existed um, as a credit course. And in our um, college that the library sits in at UNM, we're lucky enough to have an academic unit. Uh, it's the Organization Information and Learning Sciences Department, OILS. And they were really supportive of us developing a 100 level course about information studies. So the plan was to offer the course and eventually get it approved as a general education course. That took several years and I was on sabbatical when my colleagues in learning services made that happen. Um, so it will officially be offered as IADL 1110 in spring 2022 and is a part of the GE curriculum in area one. Um, and because of things that I'll talk about in a second, this means that it can be offered at any New Mexico college, which is the main reason we are having this webinar, in case you want to teach IADL 1110 at your institution. Um, in the end, getting IADL 1110 approved for the general education curriculum was helped immensely by this existence of this New Mexico Higher Education Department Essential Skills. 
Okay, so the this is the brings you to the sort of the final aspect of our information literacy program at New Mexico, which is at UNM, which is just starting to develop. So it is happening in the context of this New Mexico Higher Education NMHED essential skills. Now there are five essential skills. Information and digital literacy is one of the skills. And they were created to bring the general education curricula of all New Mexico institutions of higher education into alignment. So the information digital literacy uh, essential skill was developed by a bunch of librarians um, from all over the state. And it's made up of these four dimensions. And I'm gonna briefly show you uh, the website that my colleagues in learning services developed to help guide folks through the dimensions as the language is maybe not as clear as we would like. The dimensions are generally mapped to the ACRL framework for information literacy, but we ended up having to combine some of the frames into single dimensions. So I'm gonna hope this link works. Right, okay. Can you all see this still, the website? Okay. Um, so, let's, so here you can see the website um, where we have these dimensions and they're across the top in this blue bar here um, that are translated into um, language. So we've got the dimension, the official dimension, engage in an iterative process of inquiry that defines a problem or poses a question and through research generates a reasonable solution or answer. Um, and then we have some of the, there's a rubric associated with this. And so we can see that we've got three level, four levels, um, and they've, uh, we've offered a little bit of explanation as to what each of those levels means. And this was developed for uh, instructors in general education who are looking for something that helps explain the information and digital literacy essential skill, and for some ideas here in this assignment examples on how they might implement it in the classroom brief and I think it's a it's definitely uh, hopefully getting them started um, but we're trying to expand on this model of talking to the instructors and so um, in addition to this guidance we are going to start implementing a more of a train the trainer model in the fall we are offering a series of workshops in August for our instructors who teach general education courses. We focus this sort of first pilot project on graduate assistants who are instructors for English 1130 and COM 1120 and COM 1130, um, but are also including other GE instructors as well. Uh, we hope that these workshops will help instructors integrate information literacy skills into their courses, whether through the research projects they assign or the content they teach. For example, uh, for this research, research as inquiry dimension that is shown here on the screen that Glenn and I will be teaching, um, we're hoping to encourage instructors to integrate activities and assignments designed to encourage student curiosity while helping students learn how to build better questions and a bunch of other stuff around research as inquiry. So these workshops are just the beginning. Uh, we are hoping to expand this model in the future. So I hope that gives you some context for our courses, our course IADL 1110 and how we are doing information literacy at UNM. And now my colleagues are gonna get into the details starting with Alyssa. All right, um, so in this section, I'm gonna try to introduce the course IADL 1110 at a high level, sort of what it's about and how we structure it. Um, and so in thinking about how to describe this class in a nutshell, I was reminded of a student who was like, oh, you do the internet class. Um, and we were tickled by that. And I think we would extend it maybe a little further, but I like this idea. Like, do you remember the first time you used the internet? Maybe not. It's the most powerful information system that has ever existed, but we often take it for granted as just another part of our everyday life. And so we're living in this information age with all the challenges that come with that, things like net neutrality and fake news and the monetization of our personal information, and the list goes on. So in this class, we want to explore questions like, 
what is the internet and is an antelope a document? Is Facebook listening to my conversations? And I, am I vulnerable to getting hacked? What is the dark web? So we try to um, pick students' curiosity about various common information systems um, from university archives to Wikipedia and think about how it connects to their lives. And to further introduce IADL 1110, I do want to juxtapose it against some of the material that Laurie, Laurie was just sharing. So instead of thinking of this as sort of a, a research support or a how to use the library, this is actually coming at it from a pretty different angle. Um, because we are librarians, we certainly don't shy away from using library examples in our teaching, but they're, you know, one among a bunch of examples to kind of give a more holistic view of information literacy. And Lori, if you'll do the next slide. So as an example, one of the core concepts that we cover is organizing information. We want students to gain an awareness of organizing systems being everywhere that humans are. And so as part of this, we wanna teach some basics about databases as collections of information organized in a structured way to optimize search and retrieval. And as part of this, students learn some basics about database anatomy. Um, so they might learn about how it's composed of records that can be broken down into fields of metadata. And the thing is, we're not trying to produce apprentice catalogers or computer programmers by any means. Um, we don't have that kind of technical knowledge in any, <laughs> in any capacity, um, but we do want students to start noticing how databases are everywhere in our lives, from the music library on our phone to that website where you can quickly book your flight um, if you don't teleport to where you're going, um, to maybe that fancy health bracelet that's tracking your heart rate and um, your activity and your sleep, but maybe even your skin temperature. And so one of the points that we try to carry throughout the course is that as our technology use increases, so does the amount of associated metadata. And we want students to be aware of the consequences of more and more of our devices connecting to the internet, reporting more and more information about how we live our lives to organizations that we don't have control over. And so this is just one example that demonstrates sort of our approach and conceptualization of a third wave information literacy course. Um, we teach some core information studies concepts like organizing information, and then we try to pair that with social issues. And so in the next slides, um, these are kind of text heavy, but this is some documentation we have. So this is a catalog course description. So IADL 1110, Introduction to Information Systems of in or sorry, of information and how they impact our current social and cultural life. This course introduces organizing systems and classification, definitions of information, intellectual property and copyright, information formats, information ethics, and the history and structure of the internet. Other topics may include the history of information, social media, the attention economy, Wikipedia, net neutrality, and algorithmic bias. And then the next slide, we have our broader course goals. And so um, we want to provide an overview of that current political, social, economic um, lens for these topics of where, inner, where, where information meets society. Uh, the course will introduce the structure and function of common organizing systems like the internet um, and information formats. And the course will examine how authority is constructed while recognizing the marginalization of certain voices. And so I think we wanna always keep in mind the human element and how um, power flows through these systems. And then in the next slide, um, this is a list a little bit long, but these are our student learning outcomes. And so the, I'll go through these quickly too. The, so students will articulate a practical definition of information in order to use it intentionally and effectively. 
Um, and I uh, just to spend a second on this one, I think this is coming from the fact that that word information is everywhere. Uh, and so sometimes it can be a little meaningless. So we spend a little time up front trying to really establish um, our perspective of information as a thing, um, as evidence. So that's just a little bit there. The other student outcomes are that they'll identify and use relevant and authoritative information formats appropriate to their information needs. This comes through, I think, the most in the mini research projects that Glenn's going to talk about in a second. Um, students will understand how organizing systems work in order to retrieve and manage information stored in them. Students will engage in the iterative research process to create an information product. And students will make informed decisions about the information they use and share online. And so on the next slide, um, briefly, so this, this is the structure of the class. Um, I realize I didn't put it in here, but I'm glad Glenn said this is a three credit hour class. Um, and it so far we have taught it as an eight week hybrid course that meets in person and then online as well. And um, it's a lot. <laughs> so we would like to transition and space it out some. So it's going to hopefully be 16 weeks um, by the spring 2022. And so far, we're going to go for one section a year. This could be impacted depending on the demand now that we are in the core, UNM's core in the gen ed for New Mexico. We'll see how that goes. If we get a lot of people interested, it would be kind of amazing to expand this. Um, and I am seeing the question, how many students? Um, the cap is at 24. And it's sometimes been a struggle to get a lot of people. But the spring semester, man, that's where it is at. We, we have big classes in the spring. I don't know what happens in the fall. Um, and also, so yeah, this might be obvious, but uh, the four of us presenting today, we are the four faculty librarians, that this is part of our regular workload um, is teaching this class. And so that's a little bit about how it's set up. Um, and then I also have here the course schedule. So just so you could see in a nutshell, this is the eight week version, obviously. Um, we start out earlier in the semester with more of the concepts, the information basics. And then as we move to the end of the semester, it sort of switches over to more topics oriented. Um, and then throughout the whole class, uh, we sprinkle in Wikipedia um, and Again, Glenn will talk on more on that in a second. Um, so I'll just give it a second here, I guess, if people want to read through these, but hopefully it fits with what I've been talking about so far. OK, maybe we'll move on. And so um, really, well, I've already expressed sort of, I think, the course, what we're about in a nutshell. This last slide that I'm going to present is just to try to tie it back to the New Mexico higher education. Um, and that is to say that we developed all of this content before any of, you know, before we were like, oh, we really want to make it into the core. Um, so we didn't have to change a lot. But that being said, um, I just I think it's nice to point out a few examples of activities that highlight information and digital literacy competencies that students will gain in the class. It might paint more of a picture of what we do. Um, so there's um, there's one activity students learn about the value of information by examining copyright lawsuits and arguing if the case should be considered fair use. In another example, students organize and classify information by drafting simple database schemas using everyday items like buttons or shoes. And um, as you may have picked up, there's a heavy focus on the internet in this class. And so students learn about digital literacy by interrogating the social effects of algorithms, um, which I think Adrian will go into more detail. And students learn about online privacy and they examine their own practices for protecting their personal information. And so on that note, I will pass it off to Glenn, who will talk about the next section. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to talk about our mini research projects, our MRPs, um, and Wikipedia. 
So throughout the class, students work with Wikipedia with the ultimate goal of making significant contributions to an article. We chose Wikipedia for a few reasons. First, it's an excellent example of an information system that students are likely familiar with already. Uh, second, by making edits to it, they practice skills of identifying and filling an information need. They assess quality. They become part of a non-academic community, which includes both consumers and creators of information. And by the end of the course, they'll be able to talk about Wikipedia's role in information access in our society. Next slide, please. So to do this, we scaffold three projects, which we call mini research projects. Um, and very briefly, MRP1 is a close read. MRP2 is a log of suggested edits, and MRP3 is making edits live with a reflection. So I'll talk more in depth about each of these and explain how they evolved to our current iterations. Next slide, thank you. All right, so these assignments would be much more difficult without support work from Wikipedia's Wiki Edu program. And this program provides a platform that students enroll in that lets us track their work so we can see edits as they're making them. It also has trainings and just overall provides a lot of support for us as instructors. Typically, you apply for this by submitting your course ahead of time on the Wiki Edu site. Uh, we have students get started right away with the trainings. So the trainings cover a lot of the nuts and bolts of Wikipedia. It's kind of a nice way to ease them in, giving them some structure. It's a resource they can always return to. And we are fortunate at UNM um, because one of our librarians is a Wikipedia expert. So she created a lecture for us that covers what Wikipedia is, how it works, and has a more detailed tour of some features of Wikipedia than they would get in the trainings. So both of these we have most recently done outside of class time, so it's part of their homework. In the beginning, when we were teaching this class, students didn't actually edit Wikipedia until near the end of class. And we found that many of them were really nervous about making live edits, like there was this big buildup. So to help their confidence, um, we have an in-class in class session near the start of term where students just get in and add a fact. So they're in right away, they're making edits, you know, it's kind of like they've, we get them over that big kind of hurdle right away. Um, so in addition to the trainings and support that WikiEdu offers, the platform also lets us create a list of appropriate articles for students to choose from. Initially, we asked students to choose articles themselves, showing them how to get to lists of articles C, class, and below. And these are just articles that need a lot of work. But we found that students were having a really hard time choosing articles. It was like they had too many options almost, um, and they wanted to find the perfect thing. So we just started making a list of articles that we knew students would be able to find and add information to easily. So students can still choose their own article if they want, but we have to okay it first. During the add a fact activity, so this is the in-class adding a fact to Wikipedia, students will choose an article from that list. And most of them keep that article um, I think once they start learning a little bit about it, you know, they feel comfortable. It's like their article, um, but they can still change as long as it's before MRP1. So we show students how to add a fact. We do a demo and then we show them some useful library resources like our databases for encyclopedias, magazines, newspapers, and then the rest of class, they're just finding a fact to add. To get points, they must have one of us, usually there's a few like a few of us helping, um, okay their fact. And this is where we can check things like making sure their paraphrasing is appropriate, so it's not too close to the direct quote. Um, looking at their citation, those are it's another place folks get hung up on. And then as soon as they make their edit live, they can leave. So all of this is in preparation for MRP1. Next slide, please. 
So MRP1, um, we want the students to get really familiar with the platform and with their article. We found that students had a hard time thinking creatively about what was missing from their article, especially since it was a topic that they didn't know a lot about. So most of MRP1 is a worksheet that students are filling in. Part one asks them to choose a featured article, so an article of really high quality. Um, and we encourage them to choose something that's close to their article. So if their article that needs work is about a fish, we might encourage them to look for a featured article about fish or wildlife. And then this worksheet guides them through examining things like the talk tab or the view history tab and the citations. Part two of the worksheet has them do all the same things for their article to improve. And additionally, um, they'll check for elements of a quality article, which is a useful resource from Wikipedia. They'll assess the accuracy, reliability, and credibility of the sources um, in the article. And then we also ask them to make suggestions for what would be needed to turn this article into a featured article. The final part of the worksheet is a paragraph where students are reflecting on the differences in quality between the two articles. Next slide. All right, so MRP2. So this is where they are suggesting edits, which, um, you know, if they had done that worksheet, they should already have some support and ideas about where to go. And now they're getting more specific. So MRP2 students suggest eight substantial edits. Of those edits, half must be adding facts, and these facts must come from at least two library sources. So we made this requirement because we found that students tended to avoid adding facts, opting for edits that didn't require research, and that was just kind of resulting in an overall lower quality of edits. Um, and then when they did do research, they weren't using our library system, and so the quality of sources was getting a little bit more um, iffy. So we just made these requirements. And of course, all of their substantial edits could be adding facts, and I actually think that's easier to just add all of these facts instead of trying to figure out things like organization or uh, summarizing the article. Instead of making these edits live, students submit their proposed additions to us in a spreadsheet. So they show us the changes. So they're writing verbatim what they want to add. Um, and then they give an explanation of those changes. For the facts, we ask them to tell us how they found the source. So what steps did they use? Were they in a database? What search terms? Um, we ask what information format the source is. And we ask them for citation information. Once students turn their log in, we review all of their edits and then give feedback. So we found that this catches things like improper citations or inadequate paraphrases or images that might not have the proper license to share on Wikipedia and just generally ensures appropriate edits. By the time they make these edits live, the students can feel really confident in them. So it, again, it kind of takes away some of that nervous, like, is, the, is this right? Like, sh is this a good edit that we were getting before? Next slide, please. All right, for their final MRP, students then incorporate the instructor feedback from MRP2 and make those edits live. So this is when they're actually in Wikipedia editing it. Additionally, they need two more facts. So we're sending them off on their own without as much support. And then they write an essay about their Wikipedia experience. The reflective essay is where students describe their before and after experiences with Wikipedia. So shifting from a consumer to a creator, they give a summary of their contributions and Wikipedia more in, ge in general. So what did they learn from this experience? How might it apply in their life moving forward. And that is our MRPs. I'll turn it over to Adrian to wrap us up. Great. So thank you so much. Now that we've sort of heard some of the overarching conceptualization for the course, how it applies at UNM and structure within the course for the MRPs, the three MRPs that Glenn just went over, I'm going to take us down even more granularly into 
a week in the life. So this is sort of just a generic week. It could be most weeks that we have this structure I'm about to talk about. So just reiterating a little bit about what Alyssa said. So week four is halfway through an eight week class and that eight week class still awards three credit hours like a typical 16 week class. So it's a lot, it moves quickly. We ask a lot of the students each week so that we know um, they are getting their money's worth and putting in as much effort as they need to for a 16 week class those three credits. So there are three components to each week. Um, there's the two in-class, in-person classes in an actual classroom. Can't wait for that again. And then asynchronous or out-of-class work that is done by individuals in, this, in the class, just individual students. And that is all facilitated by the learning management system Blackboard that UNM currently uses. So the two in-class, in-person classes are synchronous in-person two times a week. It's usually been on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. And each of those in-person classes is on a different, though related topic. And those classes typically include the following three structured items. The first is a welcome reminder. What questions do you have from last time? Upcoming due dates. The second component of those two in-person classes is a slideshow lecture that, that we've created and build on that day's topic and some of the out-of-class readings. And then the third component of each in-person class is an active learning component. So they usually have to get together with a classmate or a group of classmates and do something fun. Hopefully, we think it's fun. And then that out of class piece is structured typically that they have a suite of required readings. We don't use a textbook for this class and we don't have them buy anything. So they don't have to pay. The things that we require them to read um, range in modality. So readings, viewings, listening. So newspaper articles, book chapters, podcasts, YouTube videos, um, whatever we can find that illustrates uh, that course material with an authoritativeness that we approve of. Um, so the second out of class happening that happens each week, in addition to the required readings, is a content check. So we want to know that they have read, viewed, have thought about class readings, and this sort of replaces a quiz. We have done quizzes in the past, um, but for various reasons, we are moving more towards a content check that requires them to write um, and think rather than just answer multiple choice questions mostly. So that's the second component of a typical out of class week. And the third is an active learning component. So just like the two in-person classes, that, that each incorporate an active learning component, we have them do that out of class too. And those can get really creative and I'll talk more about that in a bit. So now we're gonna look at an actual week, not just a typical week, but an actual week. Um, week four, halfway through the class is on internet and algorithms. And I'll give you an overview about this week generally. So I chose this particular week to share with you all today because for me, it really represents the spirit of the course. You might remember Alyssa talking about how we, we in our course description, we talk about the internet. We talk about it as systems of information. Um, thank you, sorry, I, for, I forgot to say, <laughs> oops, slide. Thanks, Lori. Um, so this, um, in addition to, so it represents the spirit of the course for me because we invite students to view an everyday resource or concept in a new light. The internet is something we rely on, but how many of us here know what it is really? How many of our students know what it is? 
before I started teaching this class, I had a vague notion, but now that I need to teach it, I've had to learn what is it really? What is the architecture and infrastructure of the system of information? So this week's content also for me represents how we ask students to think critically, very critically about the social implications of how information is transmitted, curated and displayed. For example, with algorithms, they're necessary for information retrieval on the internet and elsewhere, but they are endowed with the perspectives of those who wrote the algorithmic codes. These are huge, big, complex things. And our purpose is more to help students gain a top level understanding of how they work. Um, and like uh, Lori said previously, or Glenn, sorry, I don't remember who, everything I'm about to share with you about week four is included in the course materials that we'll provide a link for at the end of this slide presentation. And all of that stuff includes lesson plans, links to all the readings, activity sheets, you name it, MRPs. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the out of class and then we'll get to the in class stuff. And I know this is probably very small on your screen, but I wanted to give you the actual readings, the required stuff that they're supposed to do out of class. So the out of class stuff that they do on their own and is facilitated through the learning management system Blackboard um, supports both classes, both in-person classes. So in, in this particular week, it supports stuff about the internet and stuff about algorithms. And on the left side of your screen, you can see the out of class content that supports the internet class. Um, you can see we have, there's six short videos there in the left column. And those talk about how the internet actually works from uh, the pipes, the networks, the, the um, broadband, all of that gives students a nuts and bolts foundation of that infrastructure. So those are the required viewings just on the internet. They have more required stuff later on algorithms. But at the bottom of that first column, you can also see that we, here's where that um, active learning component comes in. And we have them do an internet interview. Um, this is where we ask students to interview a family member about what they think the internet is. What is the internet? And this helps the students and maybe the interviewee contextualize a broader understanding of the internet as a system. So moving over to the right side column, um, for the out of class required viewings and readings that support algorithms, um, you can see that we have the first one there. Why is YouTube suggesting extreme or misleading content? Spoiler alert, attention economy. <laughs> That's a Wall Street Journal video. The next thing that they read is how Google interferes with its search algorithms and changes your results. That is a Wall Street Journal investigative article. And then they also need to read a magazine article by Sophia Noble called Missed Con Connections, What Search Engines Say About Women. So those are all the required readings, viewings, whatever for that week on algorithms. Then they have two out of class activities centered around algorithms. So in total, they have three out of class activities just that they have to do on their own um, for this particular week. And those activities, I mean, they're not super long or researchy, like the algorithm reflection. We ask them to think about algorithms and what they think might have the greatest impact uh, um, in their own lives regarding algorithms. And then we also have fun stuff. Um, well, maybe it's all fun, <laughs> but we try to incorporate other types of activities. So we also have them do breaking harmony square and they play that game and I'll get to that more in a minute. But first I'm gonna talk about 
what actually happens in the in class. Next slide, please, Lori. Thank you. So week four, Internet and Algorithms in class, we meet twice that week. The first class is centered around the internet. The second class is centered around algorithms. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but um, the second course built on the, on the first class. So in that lecture, we reiterate a little bit of the content um, that they were learning about in their out of class activities. Those, basically those six videos that they needed to watch. So we build on that, but then we add um, other stuff in like a brief history of the development of the internet. Um, we sort of liken the internet to a wonderful metaphor, like the pipes, fittings, switches, and faucets in a house. They're there, it's there for stuff to move through, right? Then in the lecture, we expand to the World Wide Web, and that is actually different than the internet. Um, and you can think of the World Wide Web as the stuff that actually moves through all those pipes also known as information. Um, we then talk about browsers and Google, which is not the same as the World Wide Web, nor is it the same as the internet. So we talk about how those things are different and also other search engines. Poor little Bing gets a shout out. Um, we end that lecture with the social implications of the internet, of which search results are returned. And then we, instead of ending on like a really downer note, <laughs> we have to keep in mind like leaving them agency. And so we talk about ways to navigate this enormous network of networks more efficiently. So the in class active learning component is the internet letter. So this kind of is the other side of their internet interview where they interview a family member, but now they compose a letter to a family member. And this acts as a content check. They need to incorporate stuff that they learned in the videos and in the lecture into this letter to a great grandparent explaining what the internet is. So they do that on their own individually. They can write it out, they can write on their computer. And then we ask the students to pair up, compare letters and discuss between them. Maybe they had the same things, maybe they had differences. And then they must co-write a final letter to, the, to all the great grandparents to turn in for points. So this is a twist on a think pair share, sort of like a write pair share. So that's all in class. One, that's about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, the next hour and 15 minutes on Thursday in person class number two around algorithms, we have that slides show about her. And um, this really so uh, centers around algorithms from a social perspective, um, how they run on information inputs and then organize that information into patterns and often making predictions based on those patterns. And we, you know, we use them all the time, including asking for directions in Google Maps or Apple Music Recommendations or you name it. All of those apps Alyssa mentioned that we use every day, maybe your Fitbit. So we, we talk a little bit about algorithm history and evolution up to where we are today. I'm just going to take a sip. <laughs> um, so the social component really gets into the examples that we share in this slideshow lecture about how dominant cultures and identities have been baked into these algorithms and patterns with the consequences of reinforcing oppression and abuse of minoritized populations. And finally, we highlight thinkers and activists who are working to reshape the broad social understanding of algorithms. And finally, we do have an in-person activity for that class too. And we call this speculative futures. And I'm not gonna go into like super minute detail on this. You'll see it in the activity sheet, but broadly, 
um, we ask students to um, interact with a machine learning website. Um, it's a, a text predictor. So it's the kind of thing where you can type in a phrase into a box like, uh, learning information literacy is. And then this algorithm offers predictive text, the text generator that creates sentences and then paragraphs of sort of uh, algorithmically produced content. Um, then the students, after they play around with that and sort of laugh or try different phrases, um, maybe get inspired to use them for a class <laughs> We actually ask them to stay, take a step back and work through um, sort of the implications of this kind of technology. They work through this activity sheet where they are asked to imagine the benefits of this type of technology. Maybe they thought about that when they thought about using it to write a paper, but also the drawbacks of this technology from, from different groups' points of view. So we ask them to brainstorm the types of stakeholders that might use this kind of technology and then kind of think about how this technology could do the most harm and how it could do the most good for each of those stakeholder groups. And then finally, um, we, we actually so all of this content that we work with in class for both of these reinforces what students are learning out of class, right? And their out of class required readings and activities. And that uh, also dovetails with how we ask them to play Breaking Harmony Square. And this is my last slide. So if you could show the last slide here, Lori, on my section. Thanks. So this is a screenshot of the landing page, Breaking Harmony Square. And this game is intended to expose students to common techniques used to spread misinformation via social media. It was created by psychologists at Cambridge University with help from a Dutch media collective, a design agency, and the US Department of State and Department of Homeland Security. So a lot of uh, thought was put into this. Um, the psychologists also have done research on the effects of after students play this game, they seem to be less susceptible to social media misinformation manipulation. So it acts as sort of an inoculation against them sort of believing stuff and then further spreading it themselves on their own networks. So what is this game? Um, in this game, the player is asked to take on the position of chief misinformation officer for the town of Harmony Square. It's a choose your own adventure style game, giving the player lots of choices about how they wanna proceed at each stage. You can even choose your own name. Um, I, <laughs> Because your role as a chief misinformation officer is to be the baddiest baddie ever, um, it doesn't come off as pedantic, which I really appreciate about this game. So the object is to build an online following, racking up as many social media followers as possible by whatever means possible. So as pl players progress through the game, it becomes increasingly clear that the most effective way to get followers is to pit residents of Harmony Square against each other by sowing mistrust and anxiety, spreading emotion, exploiting posts. Of course, the use of lies, bots, and news media bait are all fair game and even encouraged. So this game epitomizes how information can be mobilized across what Barbara Pfister identified as systems of information, which Lori spoke about at the beginning of this webinar, um, and how that information can be mobilized across systems of information for base agendas that have very real social, personal, and political consequences. 
um, facilitating an understanding of the complexity of our information environments is a core goal of the course. So at this point, um, I will zoom out of week four and wrap up sort of our presentation point of this talk. Next slide, please, Lori. So we've, we talked about where we're going and now we've been there and we may have lost our top hat in the process, but hopefully it was a fun ride. So we talked about with Lori, the overview of information literacy at UNM. Alyssa helped us understand the introduction to OILS 101, now morphed into IADL 1110 or 1110. Glenn took us through the three mini research projects, um, all centering around Wikipedia, another system of information. And then I just took us through a week in the life of this class. Um, next uh, slides, the next three slides list the references that we included in this talk, including that, that first one from Barbara Pfister. Again, we'll, we'll link out to these actual slides for you. Um, and then the next two slides are image credits. We want to make sure we're valuing information properly. And then the final slide is just has our contact info. And thank you very much. Please feel free to get in touch with all of us as a group, individuals of us on this call. And please note there that uh, we have the link to the LibGuide uh, that has the zipped files for all of those course materials. So with that, um, thank you so much for listening. And we hope to take more of your questions or hear some comments on what you thought about our talk in our class. Feel free to <laughs> shout it out from the rooftop or just type it into chat, or maybe you just need a minute to think about it. We, we covered a lot of ground here. Um, I forgot how much we were gonna cover, so it's a lot to digest. So I see someone, Pamela, thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's an extraordinary class. <laughs> um, but truly, um, I'm, I'm sort of the newest member to this group of learning services librarians who teaches this. And I've just learned so much from my colleagues teaching it. And it is such a rich class that offers almost endless opportunities to incorporate like current day up to the minute types of information and examples. And that's super, super duper fun for me to like, well, this ties within this week and that week and I'll be quiet now. <laughs> uh, Kristen has a question um, about, do we co-teach or do we rotate through teaching? And um, we, have mostly co-taught it, um, but now we're trying to transition into what only one of us teaching, um, but it's, we're kind of having to juggle workloads and trying to make sure that the teaching is equitable among the four of us. So it's it's kind of mix and match right now, but I will say it, um, this was my first job out of library school. And so I found it very reassuring to be co-teaching um, all of this content with other folks. Um, so it's, I, I uh, am now a convert to co-teaching. Of the question from Pamela about how long the course was in development, honestly, it's just been a non-stop development process. The course looks very different than the original course, which was developed with my colleagues, David Hurley and Jorge Lopez McKnight. So Jorge Ricardo Lopez McKnight. So those were our first group. And, and now I would say that it's, it's um, a much stronger course. You know, when you first initially teach a course, 
you're just trying to get it sort of stood up and and get it working and and those first those first courses were good but this this one now it's 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 so much better and I haven't taught it in now it's been years because I went on sabbatical as well so um, many of the the developments have been uh, the workings of Glenn Adrian and Alyssa and uh, and including the the recent Wikipedia assignments those have even shifted since last semester so so it's been years. <laughs> and you know, it's always a development. <laughs> I think part of that though also is because of COVID, Adrian and Alyssa had to flip it online asynchronous. And so that was um, a whole different thing. And then I taught it where it was online synchronous and that required a whole other um, a adaptation. So if COVID happened, hadn't, hadn't happened, I think it would have been a little easier like everything, that's what an understatement. <laughs> I see, um, I'm going to mispronounce this, me, me, my, me, Martin. Um, I, I don't know that we talk about that. Um, I'd be interested to hear actually what, what that is that you mean. I mean, we all have our own terminology for discussing things and I do agree that there's a shift happening. Oh, there you are. Hi. Oh, all right. All right I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to crash. Um, no, go ahead. No, um, um, I, I have a degree in cultural studies and also history of the book and publishing. And so what I talk about is in terms of, you know, for all of us who are old enough, we remember the information environment of that classic classroom or the classic library with card catalogs and print media. And that world still exists, but it's shifted tremendously in the last 30 years. And so in my thinking, and maybe I'm wrong, because I've really enjoyed what you guys are doing. It sounds so similar in some ways. But what I try to do is take the students on that journey to show that, you know, if we talk about fake news, well, there really isn't anything new about it. The tools we use are new, but the challenges are still the same. Same, um, I, and so there's this massive mental shift that goes on. That's really, really important to understand. And what I'm really touching on is a works by a, a Jesuit priest named Walter Ung, who talks about the changing from oral cultures to written cultures and how that changes our mindsets. So I try to introduce the students that they are on this journey, they are part of this process of changing the way we think about things. So I was wondering if you guys touch on any of that sort of thing at all. Um, Cause I like the idea of what you're doing with Wikipedia, but I, I don't, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, that's great. I think um, what you what you're talking about makes me think of um, the section of the class we have on information formats, um, and insofar as like we we don't I don't think we push where we've been and how that has changed necessarily. Although we do have some classes on the history of information, um, but I do think we're trying to emphasize like how what is the process of information being created what is that final package that it comes to us and how is it disseminated and i think that there are some similarities in that but we we really i don't know it's threaded throughout but we just we need more time it feels like it goes so fast just trying to get these these concepts out there we do um i do talk about walter ong very briefly and orality um i think one of my things that I'm coming to realize is um, how much of my approach towards this is, has been so shaped by, you know, European ideas and models. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do is unpick that a little bit and get different ways of organizing and storing information, including oral cultures. Um, so we, yeah, we only do a very small slice. Ong is O-N-G, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, we used to, I used to do a little bit of it when we did history, we didn't, we've, we've switched a little bit away from that. Right. But I also think that for me, um, and in thinking of our students, I'm, and I, I agree with Alyssa that information formats is often where this comes out. It, it's really about the fact that they are seeing remnants of old information culture in current conventions. And so I think we try to sort of 
make that a little bit clearer like why is it like this like right. you know because we because those of us from the before times when mm -hmm. our reference point was a library and you know if for organizing information yeah. and 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 a lot of other things that that tie up to me and mental models that we have and continue to have around formats and how information is organized um a lot of us bring that with us and then we and then because we're still working in those industries we continue to use conventions that maybe don't quite make sense and so we see what makes sense to students in the things the systems that they use and that they're comfortable with like TikTok or or um sometimes instagram stuff like that so i think that's where we tend to come in with that which is trying to explain like why is this weird thing like this right, um right. because they are weird they're just conventions so right right it's like we call gmail as a male yeah, it's yes. just a legacy of a system of an old system so yeah no thank you thank you that's very nice of you i just add a little bit <laughs> um i think it's such an interesting framing um and how it sounds like we are doing really similar things or thinking about it in similar ways and what excites me too is like we are in the midst of that change too, especially when we look at the evolution of the internet. And you know, Glenn said in the chat, like, why the save button looks like a disk? Nobody uses disks anymore. Um, those remnants. But even when we think about the early internet itself, and uh, you know, flashing gifts on your personal MySpace, how that how you know, that to me points that the internet is a microcosm of this bigger trend and how things are getting more um, complex. And as Gia Tolentino says, everything on the internet bounces and refracts. And I love the internet as, a, as an example of that larger trend. Okay, I, I think we might have a slowing down of questions. I was, uh, I don't want to end things prematurely, but what do you all think? Um, I probably, oh. Sorry, oh, let me put my video on. This is Ingrid Hendricks. I'm up on the Health Sciences campus. Hi. Adrian, hi everybody. Um, I, this is fantastic and I'm like super jealous because I would love to have this kind of opportunity up on the health sciences campus. Um, because as we all know, there's certainly a lot of misinformation going on around health related things these days. Um, so this is super timely, but um, I think our biggest challenge. Well, up until very recently, we were within the School of Medicine. So um, our opportunity for being able to offer like a standalone course has been very limited. And um, I think that's one of our biggest challenges is to get this kind of eight week, six week, whatever. I mean, we've di we did a class, Sarah and I did before she um, retired, did a um, elective in the School of Medicine similar to this, not, not in this great depth, and it was certainly many years ago, but I think that's my biggest challenge is how can we offer this because it's all so super relevant to what's going on in health sciences, but trying to get in, you know, it's like, yeah, we'll give you an hour to talk about PubMed and then get out of here kind of thing. So um, being able to to talk about information in the whole environment, milieu, what they're experiencing, that sort of thing is fantastic. And it would be great to translate that into the health sciences environment, but I'm just so challenged with getting that space. Yeah, what you were talking about made me think of our journey in getting this into the GE. And one of the things that was just uh, serendipitous for us was how interested other people on main campus were. Um, like we, I mean, we just kind of stumbled into the right moment where the GEs were happening, but it seemed like a lot of people were just really concerned with things like fake news. And 
even though fake news, I don't actually, you know, we spend, we spend, we don't address it directly in great detail. I mean, it's all kind of surrounding that, but um, I think that was kind of our in for getting a lot of buy-in for this course. Um, but I'd be curious about what you other folks think, Lori, Adrian, Alyssa, like, if you have thoughts about that. It just seemed like we were just, you know, everybody was ready for a class like this. I mean, I, I do think that the, the, the GE essential skills played a part when they did that whole re, reworking statewide, um, which annoyed a lot of people because they renumbered all the courses and they, you know, and it was, it was I mean, kind of annoying. Um, but during that time, they had focused on this idea of these essential skills. And we had, um, initially, I think it was going to be just digital literacy. But they had some librarians who advocated very strongly. I wasn't a part of that initial group um, for including information literacy and digital literacy. And then um, in talking to the faculty from a bunch of different campuses, um, they really were interested in the framework framing. Like we, like we had our, one of our colleagues, Mark Emmons, who was originally in the instruction working group, but now he's you know, um, filling in as you know, dean until we get the new dean. Um, but he went and presented to this group of faculty that were statewide taking specifically ACRL framework language in with him and talked about those various frames. And they were like, yes, this is what we need. And, and so that sort of grew as we saw all of the stuff that happened, like Glenn is talking about with misinformation, fake news, this context sort of shifted to make everyone aware of that. And we just, it all happened to come together at the same time. It wasn't like planned. We weren't getting a lot of traction, I don't think either. Our course was not enrolling very heavily. And I was thinking, mm, I don't know if the GE thing is gonna work, but then the GE happened with the essential skills. We got, um, we have um, some advocates uh, at higher levels who really think that this kind of approach is, is helpful and really helped push through this into the general education curriculum. And um, so I think that that's really what it took is working at that level, right? So in these, these, these levels where these people are, important people are meeting, faculty are talking, we weren't really involved in those conversations, but we would occasionally pop up. And we did have some, we, we were part of the group, Alyssa and I were both part of the group that wrote the, the, the dimensions for the essential skill, the idea, the ideal essential skill. But your context is so much more difficult because it's so often graduate students and higher level and it's so disciplinary specific. Yeah. I just, that's yeah. a harder argument to make. It really is. Well, Although we could use it. I mean, we, yeah. You know. And I think our higher ups, we've certainly heard from are like, well, by the time they get to this level, they know all that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you all hear it as well, that it's like, oh yeah, they got this in, you know, somewhere else and they don't need it. They, they understand it all now. And it's like, yeah, no, they don't. But um, yeah, and I think I saw Colleen had put a mention in here about interdisciplinary education. I think that would probably definitely be a good place to, to try and get in there. But yeah, you're right, Lori. It's like, there's so many different disciplines that you have to address. And then just also, you know, getting to that higher level and convincing them that it's like, this is going to be useful for everybody. Well, I think about this article that I just read from a doctor talking about um, people who were like, before they're being, she's in Georgia or some state where they're having right now a, a, a spike in COVID cases, people who are about to be intubated and get put on the respirator asking for the vaccine. Yeah. And I really feel like the misinformation that is out there on, in the health world would be yeah. a wonderful entry. And I think we just have to kind of convince folks that we're not just talking to them about using the library or using PubMed mm -hmm. or using whatever, which is what they, th they think. Right. Um, and then once we show them what we're doing, then they're like, oh, right, <laughs> it, it, is, <laughs> it makes sense. And you know, Alyssa gave a wonderful, very brief presentation to the faculty that showed this course. And I think it was eye-opening for a lot of them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. But thank you all so much for doing this. This is fantastic. Absolutely. I would say just to tack on like specifically in terms of being in the right place at the right time, like curricula committee was one of those places of just having representation there. And then mm -hmm. the time was right. People were talking about this stuff and it was like, oh, hey, we teach this class. <laughs> <laughs> Way. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you for bringing it local. Appreciate that. <laughs> any other thoughts or questions oh maybe one other thing to that point um just to speak to like adrian is starting to collaborate with other yes. um, instructors um and weaving information literacy into um courses so that could be another avenue i don't know if adrian you want to talk at all about that sorry to throw you out there but that i thought that was like a solution potentially Sure, I'll, I'll say just a little bit. I think part of the infrastructure that allowed um, OILS 101, now IADL 1110, to gain traction is that it was through the OILS department, right? Like we had a home, <laughs> essentially. And it's been really great to be a part of that um, department. And they already have the infrastructure for um, a special topics course at the the lower level, like one and 200 level, and then a three, another special topics course at the 400 level. So as we know, special topics can rotate. And um, I'm gonna be co-teaching with a faculty member in the Honors College on sort of, uh, she invited me to co-teach her class, why people believe weird things. And they really talk about conspiracy theories and and biases that we have just as humans and as we've evolved. Um, and so I'll be infusing some critical information literacy types of, not critical information, that's a different, critical thinking comma information literacy <laughs> um, into that as like a one-time special topics course. Um, and so beyond just like, I feel really lucky to have this opportunity. I. I hope that then this instructor will be able to sort of say, hey, this is what the library is doing. We're not just doing these bibliographic sessions. So um, that might be another direction we can go in or that you know, we can reconsider, but it's sort of a proof of concept doing a special topics class. I'm so glad this has been helpful for some folks. Okay, this is actually about the amount that I expected to come <laughs> like initially when I was like, it's just gonna be New Mexicans. <laughs> Uh, and I was excited <laughs> about that. Does anybody else have any questions? Lean, do you wanna? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna thank our speakers again. I'm gonna stop recording.